Greetings, brethren. Again, happy Sabbath to all of you. As I mentioned, uh, tonight is the start of Purim, and um, I do want to be talking about that today. I um, We look at the world around us, and there is a resurgent anti-Semitism. We recently covered this in the magazine. It's just unbelievable. Uh, of course, we had the terrible October 7th attack by Hamas on Israel, and that was just utterly horrific to see. And uh, then that is, of course, you know, there was retaliation on the part of Israel, and then, then Israel was attacked by the world, basically, for uh, that retaliation. And uh, as far as, you know, condemnation, but also just major uh, protests and a lot of pro-Hamas uh, demonstrations in America and in other Western nations. We had uh, the, um, not just... Um, Governments coming out like Turkey saying that they were supporting Hamas <laughs> and but we have uh, all of uh, You know these these young people uh, in in uh, our country and Western nations that are somehow uh, idolizing even uh, Osama bin Laden and a lot of these other uh, you know anti-israel groups. It's, sh it's shocking to see it's absolutely amazing and mind-boggling to see that um, and of course, I just mentioned we had a, a new bill was just passed to, to basically try to continue our, our gov keeping our government open, but they passed a lot of uh, garbage things uh, to do that, <laughs> including stuff that's you know anti-Israel right in our own government. And our own government, by the way, has has been the one to preserve Israel from condemnation repeatedly uh, by the United Nations. The United Nations uh, they, they don't you know ever condemn people that are doing horrific, unbelievable things, but they always condemn Israel. <laughs> it's just absolutely amazing, uh, again and again and again. And that's not to say Israel has been perfect and they do everything right, and uh, maybe not even in, in what they're doing now, but uh, they are facing people who want to wipe them out. You know, there's long been this idea that, you know, Israel and its neighbors, if you, uh, if, 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 um, if the neighbors would lay down their arms and, and cease from you know acting against Israel, there would be peace. If Israel would lay down its arms, there would be no Israel. <laughs> they would just be completely obliterated and eliminated. And of course, that is um, a product of the enemy of all of mankind, but especially uh, the people of Israel and God's spiritual Israel uh, was is the uh, number one target of the enemy. Who the the enemy being the devil, which we heard about a little bit earlier in the message. Uh, the sermon that, and I appreciated that because it's a very good lead into this. Of course, there's been pre persecution going on against the Jews for ages. Uh, we had, uh, you know, attempted genocide under Hitler, the final solution. <laughs> I mean, well, how, what, what a horrid name for it, but, you know, what do we do about these people? <laughs> the final solution. Let's, uh, let's just eradicate them. Let's just get rid of them utterly. But, of course, there's been other attempts to wipe them out, going back to what we read in Esther under the villain Haman. Esther recounts how the Jews were delivered. Some argue that, well, there was just some human choices made here. There's no mention of God. Actually, some people decry the book as not inspired because there's no mention of God. They say, well, it's not really, it shouldn't even be in the Bible. And, uh, you know, you go back to some people in history, even like, like Martin Luther had a real rough time with this book because it was basically just saying, uh, you know, the people... Um, were being judged and punished all these others for for basically trying to destroy the Jews, <laughs> and of course that had been going on in Europe for a long time anyway, in many uh, in many places, and it's just sad, but um, and horrific. But yeah, this idea that well, it's not really an inspired account. Now I will mention that um, you see in the Septuagint. By the way, if you ever look at that, that's the Greek uh, version. There's a lot added to the book. Uh, that actually tries to make it more spiritual focused and has has a lot of things added. But it's clearly stuff that was added. It was not part of the original. Uh, it was uh, an attempt to, um, in in one sense, um, amend it to make it more fitting for the rest of the Scripture. But it's quite fitting for Scripture uh, because it uh, it does not uh, go against the uh, idea that uh, you know God is not mentioned. God is not mentioned explicitly, but the events that occur in this book are not just coincidence. Obviously, they were guided supernaturally 
both sides, actually, as we heard earlier. You know, there's certain things that are happening from the dark side in that book, trying to get rid of the Jews, trying to wipe them out, uh, and uh, working through human agents to, to make that happen. But that is not allowed to prevail because there are other forces at work that uh, prevent that from happening. Now, some recognize that's what's going on in the story, but they'll also just deny the historicity of it. They say, this just can't, this just can't be, this didn't happen. And uh, there's all kinds of arguments for that, but there's a good historical precedent that this is set quite well. Uh, all the descriptions that are there, uh, the, the time frame of it, as we fit this into the reign of Xerxes, uh, it actually fits very well. Uh, in in looking at what happened during his reign and his time when he was trying to take over Greece and you know, we just lay that out. We go through that in the commentary online and I do recommend uh, going through that. We've just uh, read through that recently because uh, we went through the book of Esther here for this past week uh, just thinking about the time of Purim and, uh, and some of the commentary. So I do recommend this is a good time to read back through. But we'll cover some of it today. Now, again, God is not explicitly mentioned but uh, God is there. Actually, the very meaning of the word Esther, it's interesting because you get these two characters, Esther and Mordecai, and on one level you say, well, actually, the, these are pagan names. That's another reason some people say, well, this is, this is not really legitimate because you, don't have, you, you wouldn't promote these pagan names. But of course, uh, in um, Gentile empires, uh, persons of, uh, you know, who are people of faith even, Daniel and his three friends, they were given basically these pagan names in their society there. And, uh, you know, Joseph was renamed by the Pharaoh. You see that people, and we don't know when, let's say, Esther had this name. Maybe it was when she was brought in into the harem. I mean, she was supposed to be not revealing her Jewish heritage. A lot of times uh, people just had these, these kind of uh, common Gentile names. Is Esther is the same as Ishtar, basically. It basically means the star, but it means the goddess. That's what he's talking about. You know, Venus, <laughs> the planet. Uh, but, but, but Ishtar is, uh, is basically what that name is. But it's a very, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a one letter off, and it sounds very close in Hebrew to a word meaning hidden. And uh, it's maybe a good hint to what's going on in the book. Because certainly she was hidden in the sense of what her identity was. But what's really hidden is who is directing what's happening in this book. Brethren, what I want to key in on today is the fact that amid terrible persecution and trials, God is present to guide things, even if he's not seen, and it will all work out. Amid terrible persecution and trials, God is present to guide things, even if he's not seen, and all will work out. And the title is Esther. God is in this story. God is in this story. Um, I'm going to start with a quick pass through the book, hitting some highlights here. If you flip over to there, uh, let's turn to the book of Esther. And I do generally try to go back through this every year. So in one sense, none of this is new. These, is, these are things that... Uh, as we revisit them, just like we do with the stories that surround uh, the holy days. And uh, Purim, we understand, is not a commanded festival in the law. Uh, it's not one of the ones that is given there as God's appointed times in Leviticus 23, but it is a biblical holiday because it is actually introduced and bound on the Jewish people there in the, uh, in the book of Esther. And also, um, it does have meaning for us. Because as I pointed out uh, several times before, if not for what happened at the time of Esther, if, we're not, if not for what Purim celebrates, there would have been no uh, first century Judaism. There would have been no, and because of that, there would have been no Christianity. And we would not be sitting here. So the very fact that this deliverance happened when it did, um, preserved the Jewish people, allowed for the continuance and the, uh, the production of the Messiah and the, uh, the truth uh, to be proclaimed to the world, if, uh, if not for that. Um, so that does have meaning for us. So it's something that we should be reflecting on. Uh, it's, certainly it's in the Bible. 
And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable, uh, as we're told in uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, for us to study and to learn from and to grow in and to gain the lessons from. Uh, let me just see. I flipped off of it for a second. Let me get back to it. Going through here then, uh, we start out in... Um, Sorry, I flipped off. Of, there we go. Okay, should have put a marker there. <coughs> uh, in chapter one, <coughs> we're told about the reign of Xerxes. It says Ahasuerus, but uh, in Hebrew, that's something like uh, Akhverosh. Ach, and in, uh, in the Persian, his name is uh, Kashyarsha. It's a kind of weird pronunciation. We figure out how we get to the, the Greek uh, form Xerxes, X-E or X-E-S. But I do believe that is, um, that is an accurate uh, transformation of that uh, wording uh, from uh, in Hebrew that uh, Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus, <laughs> cough it out there, is uh, the same as the Greek Xerxes uh, and uh, that we're talking about the same character. But uh, it talks about he had this wife, uh, Vashti, uh, who was the queen, and she ends up getting uh, deposed. She's taken off the throne, and I don't want to go into all that. Um, but um, then they go, they say, well, we need to find somebody to replace her. So that's what you see in chapter two. They're going on a hunt to replace this uh, Vashti, and they're bringing all these women into the royal harem. And uh, they bring in this young Jewish woman, Hadassah, who is raised by her cousin Mordecai as an adoptive father. And um, that's interesting. I mean, at one level, this is another reason why people criticize the book. It says, well, here's this girl. She marries this foreign Gentile king, and she should not have done that. Well, obviously, that is not a good idea to do. Okay, I'm going to say that we, we agree with that. But in one sense, also, let's remember, these people, uh, they may not have been, you know, biblical scholars in one sense. Uh, certainly there was, among the Jewish people, there was a very high mind toward obeying God's law. And I think Mordecai uh, did have that. And he probably raised Esther to be faithful in that sense. But uh, how deep they were in following God is not clear. They had been in captivity in, Bab in Babylon and Persia for quite some time. Uh, when we get to this story. So, uh, you know, there could have been some lapses, but I don't want to criticize uh, for that because the real issue here is this young girl is basically taken away from her home and uh, and made to be part of a harem. It's not like she had much say about the, the situation. Uh, you know, a lot of times when people complain, they, things would go much worse for them. And we don't know uh, all the circumstances there, so we can only go by what we read. And uh, it's clear, by the way, that again, there was somebody behind the scenes that were working out the fact that she was able to be in the position that she ended up being. Of all these women, she ends up being the favorite and becomes the queen of the Persian Empire. And that is pretty astounding. It's not a coincidence that that happened. Uh, then we see at the end of this chapter, by the way, it mentions that uh, there was a, in verses 19 through uh, 23, that uh, that Mordecai was in the king's gate. And by the way, we don't know why, uh, whether he had that job before or because Esther was in her role, she, she might have given him uh, that job. Basically, he was some kind of an official. Uh, and in that capacity, he overheard uh, a plot to try to uh, take out the king, to assassinate uh, Xerxes or Ahasuerus. And uh, they inquired and find out it was true. And they hanged uh, the, these men on the gallows. And it says in verse, uh, the end of verse 23, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So this was uh, written down what happened and uh, that Mordecai had turned these guys over. So there was some awareness of that. But as we were going to find out later, Mordecai was not rewarded for that at the time. And that is going to be quite significant. Uh, then we get into chapter 3 which goes into Haman's plot. And as we find out here, uh, this figure, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, uh, there's a lot of people who believe, and Josephus uh, wrote, that 
as an Agagite, that he was a descendant of Agag, the, the king of the Amalekites, and that God had uh, decreed against the Amalekites perpetual war, basically, because the Amalekites tried to uh, hurt the the women and kids and everybody else. They, they attacked ruthlessly against Israel when Israel came out of Egypt. So that's interesting, too, if you think about the time-wise, because, of course, we're now here a month before Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, and that time the Israelites came out of Egypt, but the, one of the, the first big things they faced was these people of Amalek trying to destroy them, trying to take them out. And, uh, and that began a perpetual war with Amalek, and we see it raging uh, you know, through history, and, and it, it apparently was continuing at this time that uh, what we see is that Mordecai would not bow to Haman. Now, it doesn't say he wouldn't bow to the king or anybody else. It's very specific about not bowing to Haman, and Haman was very upset about that. And likely, this probably has something to do with the fact that Mordecai is a descendant of, it says, of Shimei, of Kish, uh, which is of the line, you know, the, the, the family of Saul, who was supposed to have been, you know, the early king of Israel, who was supposed to have wiped out the Amalekites, didn't do the job. And um, I think they realized that should have happened in that family later. Uh, Mordecai uh, will not bow to this Haman, who was an enemy of his people. And in fact, it says in verse 5, when Haman, this is chapter 3, verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage. Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. I mean, think of it. <laughs> this guy won't bow to me. I want to kill all of the Jews throughout the whole kingdom. I mean, what a monstrosity. Clearly, there was more to this than the fact that he just didn't like that guy. And he was upset with him. This had to do with a, a hatred against the people of Mordecai. And he realized that we're dealing with these people that are the enemies of his people. And uh, he wanted to wipe them all out. And so uh, they, you know, cast, we're told that they, they, to, they're going to do this. And uh, they went to find an auspicious time to, to wipe them out. So they cast poor, poor is the Akkadian word for lot. Uh, basically, it's like you're throwing dice, trying to come up with, uh, with the time you're going to do this. And uh, there's some question about how this went. It seems like they kept casting the lot until it landed way, way later in the year. They did this when? They actually did this in the first month, it says, uh, and it was on the 13th day, by the way, of the first month. So this is the day before Passover is when they were casting these lots. There's definitely an overlap, by the way, between Purim and Passover, and there's in several ways. We've talked about this before, but um, they, they cast lots at this time of Passover, but when it landed was, you know, way off in the 12th month, a month before the next Passover. So they had a lot of time to prepare for this destruction, the Jews did, and, and uh, you know, we're told in... Um, Proverbs 16, verse 33, I'll just reference, it says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Because ultimate, that doesn't mean that God is going to, you know, intervene in every casting of lots. But clearly, every casting of lots, you know, when, when it's about something like this, God can intervene. It's not. It's it's ultimately up to him whether you know if people are going to do some major decision in a in a country like this, how it's going to land. God can decide how it lands, and He does at times. And here, uh, He decided to have this come much later. And I don't think it was a coincidence that God had it land exactly a month before the next Passover. There's significance to that as well, uh, in 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 a sort of a preparation for Passover, if you think about it. Uh, when uh, which this would ultimately be <clears throat> now continuing on, on in this account we see what uh, how this this whole destruction of the Jews was sold to the king 
Verse 8, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. They're everywhere. They're all over, these infiltrators. Their laws are different from all other people's, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it please the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver in the hands of those who do the work to bring into the king's treasuries. This is a lot of money, by the way. I'll pay it. Now, did he have all that fortune himself? My guess is no. My guess is his thought was, I'll take it from the Jews. We're going to wipe them out. We'll get all their money, and we'll be able to pay that into the treasury. And also, you need to think, wasn't he disappointed that it was so far away? Didn't it even occur to him that uh, that he, you know, a lot of people would be, you know, they would run or they would they would flee. They would not stick around to get killed. I think he probably was fine with that. In other words, yeah, they were going to kill who they could, but he was also fine with a lot of people just kind of hightailing it out of there and leaving all their stuff, <laughs> you know, leaving their property and leaving their belongings that they could be plundered and taken. Uh, and that they'd be able to steal all that from them. So uh, this is, uh, but but again, I want to make the point here that yeah, these people are different. You know, they they're not uh, they're not like us. They uh, they keep other laws, and of course we know about that. That's uh, you know we hear these kind of criticisms too. A lot of times we're criticized for being Jewish <laughs> in our beliefs and and in our practices, and of course um, in some ways we do have. A great deal of overlap there. Actually, we're called spiritual Jews uh, in in the New Testament. But um, then we come to chapter 4, by the way. Mordecai learns about this plot. And again, he was in a position to hear about it there and how it all came down, the details of it. You know, there was a decree that went out, but the decree didn't give all those details that I just mentioned there about, you know, how he sold it to the king and what happened there. And by the way, I'm not sure the king, it was never explicitly explicitly stated to the king that it was the Jews, and I'm not sure the king realized it was the Jews. Later, when he wants to honor Mordecai the Jew, there's no issue about that. But uh, we don't, um, But may, or maybe he just thought it was some of the Jews, I don't know. But he basically gave uh, Haman free reign to do what he wanted. And uh, that was a, you know, a dastardly thing that they, you know, basically had a toast <laughs> to taking care of the problem, to the final solution to this terrible problem that existed in the land. Well, Mordecai in chapter 4 learns about it, and then we see, as uh, mentioned here, it says in verse 3, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. You know, why were they doing that? Oh, they were just fasting because that's just something to do. <laughs> that's absurd. Now, this is clearly for a religious purpose. They're beseeching God. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't say that anywhere in the account. I do find it remarkable that, and I've speculated before that maybe this book was written as a Persian state chronicle, which is possible why it doesn't mention a lot of, about you know, the, the religious aspect of God and stuff. But you might still expect it to say that the Jews besought their God or something like that. But it, it doesn't say anything like that. And I think that's very intentional that God's name is not mentioned uh, or any reference in that sense. It's a very explicit thing that it's not mentioned. But anyway, he, he you know, this was found out that he's, that, that he's also, um, Mordecai is in mourning and in sackcloth and he's, and uh, he's outside the, um, the harem there, and there are messages being passed full, back and forth between him and um, Esther about what's going on. And so he, Mordecai passes on the decree and explains what happened. And um, then, verse 11, uh, Esther gave this command for Mordecai, all the king's servants and people of the king's provinces know that any man, because he wanted her to go into the king and make supplication for the people, but she says, she says any, anybody that does this, that, that goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, and she had not been called uh, in for a month, uh, he has but one law, 
Put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go to the king these 30 days. She saw herself as out of favor. Remember, he had lots of wives, and it was a very terrible thing in that sense. Uh, and, uh, and if you came into the presence of the king unsummoned, uh, you could be executed. And that's actually mentioned uh, by Herodotus, the Greek historian uh, at that time, who was, uh, was uh, giving a lot of the de details of the Persian kingdom. This is very true. And she was, in that sense, considering herself to do that, that she would be in mortal peril. But he, uh, Mordecai, has the, the message back for her. And it's a powerful message in the book. And it's a critical message, not just this book for, for all of us. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. But you were put here for this reason. Now, wait a minute. Why does he say that deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place? Why does he know that? Again, there's more going on here than just the simple operation and decisions of human beings. He knows there's more to the Jewish story going far back that God had repeatedly delivered his nation, his people, again and again, and that God had prophesied a future for these people, and it was going to happen. And if she didn't get on board with that and do what she could do to help deliver them, then she and her father says, says would perish. But the Jews would still be delivered. Because why? Because it just would happen for some unknown reason, a coincidence? No, because God is in this story. And he knew that. And he knew that God would deal with situations to save his people. You know, there's many times we see in the, in the scriptures that, that God, you know, makes the point that his plan is not going to be thwarted. Our role is to get on board with that plan. Remember, it says in the, the New Testament about the, the people praising uh, Jesus, and he says, you know, if, if they didn't do this, even the rocks would cry out, which would be pretty sad if, it, if that had to happen. I mean, we always we think about that. We don't want that to happen. In other words, we want to be part of the program and get done what God is doing. The message of the kingdom is going to be preached, whether we do it or not. God has promised that it's going to be. But we have a part in it as long as we will step up to the plate and do what we're told to do and be part of it. That's what she's being told here. You were put here for this reason. Who knows whether you were? It looks like you were. And let's make let's see what will happen. Live up to that. Do what you were called here to do. And be the deliverer of your people. And put yourself on the line. Because if you don't, it's not going to go well for you anyway. Jesus also said that, remember? He said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who, you know, sacrificed his life, you know, for my sake, you know, he will live. And that ultimately, even if you die, ultimately you will survive and thrive forever. That is the truth that we know. And that's the wonderful truth that uh, we can rely on through all trials and problems. So what does she do? I mean, she responds to that. Esther told them, verse 15, to go to reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. You know, because this fasting is just something to do. There's no real purpose in it. I mean, clearly there is a purpose. The purpose is to beseech God and ask for his intervention and to help her in what she's going to do. She's not going to the king yet until she fasts for three days to draw near to God. It's very interesting, by the way, because she could have put it off for a long time. I mean, they had many, many months to go, and maybe she would have kept sitting there saying, 
oh, you know, I, I can't do this yet. I, I'll just wait and wait and wait and see how things go. No, she actually went to take this action very early, but she didn't do it um, rashly. She did it with having the people go and pray and beseech God for these three days of fasting uh, to really seek God and draw close to him to be able to, uh, to do um, what God wanted in that sense. And she says, and I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commands him. And we're going to find out in the next chapter, she comes back. On the third day, she comes to the king. And is that significant? It is significant. I believe it's very significant because if you look at the time frame, and I've discussed this before, the time frame is quite astounding. That it was on the 13th that this decree went out, and uh, basically um, there's all this mourning going out from... Uh, from um, Mordecai and the message got out even even to some of the provinces started to started to get out to them and so it must have been by that that night it must have been you know and into the next morning when he was having this exchange with Esther about what to do that would have been actually on the Passover day and that it was actually on the Passover day that Esther probably made this determination that we're going to fast for, th for three days, you know, night and day. And on the third day, she's going to go into the king. So the fast then would start that night, probably, which would have been the end of the 14th and into the, for three days and nights. That is exactly the same three nights that Jesus was in the grave. I don't think that's a coincidence. If, if, and by the way, I could... Maybe we're off by a day or so here. I don't think so. But if we are even, there's still a clear overlap in these days. This would be happening when? During the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's when this was happening. And that is no coincidence. Uh, no way is this a coincidence. Uh, when the attack from the enemy came, that's when he wants to really attack God's people is at these holy times. We talked about that recently in the, in the magazine. But God is there to defend things and to make things work out the way he wants them to. And so she is in basically mortal peril of life for three days. But on the third day, she goes to the king. He puts out the golden scepter. And she is, in that sense, brought out from death into life, which again ties in very much with, G with Jesus Christ, the ultimate Savior, who put his life on the line and actually did die. Well, she had put her life on the line as a type of Christ in that sense for the deliverance of her people. And uh, a royal figure, by the way, who actually died, or you know, in, in committed to dying uh, for the sake of her people, uh, and for three days was in that mortal peril, and then at the end of that uh, was raised to life and effected the end of the reign of the enemy as we heard in the sermon head as well. That was what that was about. So there's a strong parallel there, and it's really amazing to think about. Um, so here in um, chapter 5, we've got uh, the fact that she's given this favor from the king um, and given life. And he asks, what do you want? She says, I want to have a banquet. And so they go to the, and she invites Haman as well. I don't know why she invited Haman, except maybe she just wants to kind of get things set up. Maybe she was thinking she would she wanted to accuse him directly instead of behind his back. That may, may very well be. But for some reason at the banquet, you know, when the king asks, okay, now what's your request? She she doesn't uh, she doesn't do it. She doesn't she doesn't do it. That's just amazing to me. She doesn't do her accusation then. She waits. She says, well, come back tomorrow for another banquet. Why did that happen? I'm not sure, except that what we do know is that, you know, this is a big deal. Actually, this is huge. 
The king doesn't even ask why. Why, well, why, why won't you tell me now? Why would he come back again? Okay, Haman goes home and, uh, and he's going to, and, and things are going to happen overnight, as we're going to find out in just a minute, that have to happen that night to get set up for the next day. And that's when it's really going to come down. But he goes home, verse 13, here in uh, chapter 5, says, you know, Morde- or Haman's all excited. He's, he's in verse 12, Oh, Queen Esther invited me, no one but me to come in with the king to banquet that she prepared. And, uh, you know, tomorrow I'm again invited. It's so exciting. Uh, along with the king. Verse 13, yet all this avails me nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Just can't get past that awfulness. You know, how bitter uh, envy and hatred against this man, even with all that he had. So it wasn't all about what would all, um, would all, that man had that man just would not bow to him and respect and honor him the way he wanted and he was twisted into knots over it and so his family says says uh well hey let a gallows be made and we think well that's to 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 hang from the neck but it actually probably was some kind of a scaffolding for uh putting you know just fastening a body up or even um impaling a person is what this is probably really talking about and uh, and tell uh, in the morning tell the king uh, that Mordecai be hanged on it, and then go happy to then then be happy at the banquet, <laughs> you know. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. So they built this, and then chapter six is the turning point. That night, the king could not sleep. It says. That's very interesting. Because again, is that just a coincidence? Did the king, uh, well, just all of a sudden he can't sleep. I mean, why couldn't he sleep? Well, maybe it was just he, maybe he, he normally couldn't sleep. No, this is a, that may be, but whatever the case is, there's something significant to the fact that he couldn't sleep. He says, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Uh, because that's what you do with your time, uh, when you have uh, time awake at night, I don't think so. Um, I think, personally, I think this was uh, a snooze fest. This is a way to have somebody put you to sleep. Let's just read some some stuff that you know. Start reading some history to me, and all of a sudden, you know, he's gonna he's gonna conk off to sleep. That's probably the idea here. Is what I think was happening. And uh, but it was found written that Mordecai had told of uh, this plot against the king. Uh, and and it you know was rescued the king and the king said verse three what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this and the king's servants who attended him said nothing has been done and that's a big deal by the way because the Persians wanted to reward loyalty because you you want to you want to pu- harshly punish you know people that are against you but you want to really reward the loyalty because you want to make sure people stick by you and uh, that had not been done. And it's it's you know noted in history even that you know they would uh, they would want to make sure to do that, but he had not done that, so he's thinking, oh no, we need to do something. So he says, who's in the court? And Haman had just entered because he's coming to tell him, oh let's hang Mordecai on uh, you know or impale him or up, up on the gallows. And the king sa- servant says, well Haman is there standing in the court, probably early morning. And the king said, well let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman thought, well, who would he want to honor more than me? So he says, you know, well, let him be on on the royal house and paraded through and and with one of the king's high officials, you know, saying, thus it is for the man the king delights to honor. And the king says, that is great. Do that for Mordecai the Jew. And it's just astounding uh, because then it just says, and so so Haman did this. But there's no way, you know, to think about the utter chagrin of, of, of this situation. It's just amazing. I don't know if you've seen the, the, that 
the movie I, I mentioned with of this, and I do recommend the movie because it's very, very close to the biblical account, is the book, the movie on Esther. I think it's Visual Bible, but it's F. Murray Abraham is playing Mordecai. And when this scene is happening, it's just amazing uh, because Haman is just, he's just utterly humiliated. And Mordecai is just beaming. He's just so happy. And of course he would be that this was, he's, he's sort of, because why also is he beaming? He's not just happy at what's happening uh, with Haman, okay? It's not just about, oh, look what I get. That's not what Mordecai's thinking. Mordecai was thinking what we all would be thinking, which is that there was a big plot by Haman to kill all the Jews. And now here's this guy having to lead him through the streets and praise him. And what does Mordecai know? He knows that God is in this story. He knows that God is turning the tables. He knows that God is doing this. This isn't a coincidence that this has happened. This is utterly turning things upside down from the way that they were. And it's really amazing. Um, and of course then, um, you know, even his family can see it, by the way, Mordecai, or, or Haman's family, because he goes home, he says he covered his face, he's just so full of shame. And when he told his wife and all of them in verse 13 uh, about this, and they said, it, well, if Mordecai, whom you have uh, begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. They, they're the one, this, is, this is not looking good for you. This is very clear. By the way, that again is letting you know that they recognized that there were greater forces at work here, that this was not just something that was being orchestrated on a human level. This was beyond a human level. And, uh, but then, verse 14, okay, time, time for the next banquet. And then we see that, and then we come to that in chapter 7, uh, this second banquet, which is the end of, of Mordecai. Here we have uh, the enemy is exposed, I'm sorry, the end of Haman, not of Mordecai, Mordecai, the end of his trouble in that sense. Not fully, but, uh, but in a big way. The enemy is exposed. Haman is done for. And there's poetic justice here in the fact that, you know, what, what is to be done about him? Well, he's going to be hanged or as it, possibly impaled on the very gallows that he had built to do this to Mordecai. The penalty he sought is going to come back on his own head. And that is, again, quite a, a just thing. Uh, then we move into chapter 8. And we see that um, Haman's estate is given to Esther, who gives it to Mordecai. And again, there's justice in that. This person who had sought this to, to plunder the Jews, all that he has is given over into the hands of Esther and then Mordecai. And the, the Mordecai is elevated by the king to prime minister in place of, of Haman. So now his office is also given over to this person that he sought to destroy. Esther, we're told here, pleads again for her people, and the king has to put out the scepter again. And this is in the third month of Sivan, by the way. When And it's a, a, right after Pentecost that they are putting out this second decree. So it may have been right at Pentecost, or right then, that, they, that she had gotten this resolve from the king to be able to deal with the with the issue it's pretty amazing because if you think about this here's the problem as we read in Daniel and other places it mentions the law of the Medes and Persians which cannot be changed and there was already a royal decree for what for the destruction of the Jews that was going to happen on the 13th of Adar and the king is makes the point well this cannot you know be undone but you guys go work on a new decree. Well, to do what? Not to undo the first, but to countermand, in other way, or to work around what was done there. Which is quite interesting, by the way, because all of us, all of us are condemned under a law that cannot be changed. If you think about that. 
because of our uh, certain violations that we've done, and we've been taken captive by the enemy, and he has used this law that exists, which is a good laws. These are all good laws, but they're being, but they ultimately would destroy us. But there's other ways that this can be worked out to, there's other laws in operation <laughs> that enable someone to actually, in this, in our case, to someone to actually die in our place. And then someone to help us obey the laws as we need to. And someone to deliver us ultimately. Uh, there is a, there's a, a plan and a way to do that. That you don't abrogate and necessarily get rid of the law that's there to be able to, uh, to change the situation and bring the needed deliverance. But um, so Esther and Mordecai write a new decree that enables the Jews to defend against their enemies. And we see at the end of this chapter in uh, verses um, 16 and 17, it says the Jews had light. Now the Jews had light and gladness joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So, wow, this is really the tables have turned. Not only um, people are happy now, there's a way to be delivered. There's a way... Uh, to be free of this terrible problem that was facing them. But many of the people of the land, they converted. I put that in quotes. I don't know that they really became Jews, but they all, now they say they're Jews because it sounds, because it's maybe dangerous to not be a Jew. I think a lot of them were probably afraid of Mordecai in his position. And they were afraid of, you know, Esther the queen, who is <laughs> at such a powerful influence who is who is a Jew and they need to uh, get in line with that and that is an amazing thing that things have turned uh, to the degree that they have and then we come of course to chapter 9 which is where the Jews are going to destroy the enemy forces and we're actually told here in this chapter also specifically that that includes the ten sons of Haman and by the way, that's a big deal in the scroll. The, the, the actual, the Megillah is the name, what they call Esther, but that just means the scroll because it's the main one of the, fe of the festival scrolls. Uh, the, the ten sons of Haman, by the way, are written really big. It's not like the rest of the account. They're like, they're like this big list of these names, except the, there's, some, there's some weird um, things there in the Hebrew. The, a few of the letters are small, uh, and, and some people have pointed out that these letters uh, form... The, the certain numbers that point to a date in the future. I'm not going to go on all that. It's very interesting. But it ends up being 1946, <laughs> which I will tell you about something else in a, in a second on that. Anyway, um, they, um, what we find out here in reading the account is that on the 13th, they end up defending themselves and, you know, basically destroying their enemies. Uh, all these thousands are... are throughout the land, and um, on the 14th day, they have this feasting and gladness. But at the capital, that's in uh, verse uh, 17, but in verses 18 through 19, it says that at the capital, the fighting continues through the 14th, so there they celebrate on the 15th. So Purim is, in that sense, the two days of celebration on the 14th and the 15th. Uh, and the, the way it would work is the people of the, the general land would keep would observe the 14th and the people at the capital would observe the 15th and the Jews continue that today because basically all the Jews in the world keep the 14th uh, as the um, as the day of a of a main observance but in um, in Jerusalem their capital they observe the 15th and it's the, it's kind of a takeoff on on what happened here uh, and then we're given the decree to celebrate in verses uh, 20 through 32. It tells about the institution of Purim, and you can read that, uh, uh, you know, as you're on your own. Uh, but tonight would be a good time just to be in, re refreshed on going through this a little bit. I can leave some for you to look through. But um, 
And then we have this short chapter 10, which gives uh, is about Mordecai's advancement. Now, again, Purim is not a, a commanded holiday for us, but it is sort of like a national holiday. We think of in terms of like Thanksgiving. You know, that's not a day that we're commanded in law to keep, but it is an honorable day to keep and a good day to keep for Americans. And, uh, and, and elsewhere, you know, have national days of observance and celebration and thanksgiving to God. And Purim is, is in many ways, is basically a thanksgiving day for the Jews, thanking him for that tremendous deliverance. But as I've mentioned, uh, so there's not, in that sense, uh, a requirement that we observe that. But it has great meaning for us. It's in the Bible. And as I mentioned, without what happened at Purim, we would not be sitting here today <laughs> observing the Sabbath. It just wouldn't have worked out. It, you know, th th this was a hinge point of history, one of those big ones that we can think about, uh, you know, what God did in a big way. Now, there's been repeated attempts to destroy the Jewish people. Of course, you had Antiochus Epiphanes, the time of Hanukkah. It's the same thing uh, with that time. Later, we've had, you know, at the, you had the pogroms or the organized massacres of the Jews in Russia in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And, of course, the Holocaust... I do want to read something about, about this. This, is, um, this was written in 2013 uh, called Purim. This is by uh, Rabbi Michael Leo Samuel, um, and it's called Purim Fest 1946, The Tale of Julius Stryker. During the Holocaust years, Purim celebrations were forbidden to the Jews. Christians and Jews could not enter, or sorry, could not even own the Book of Esther, such decrees did not stop the Nazis from poking fun at the Jews on this Jewish holiday. With diabolical glee, the Nazis frequently orchestrated special killings with the Jewish festivals. On Purim in 1942, the Nazis hanged 10 Jews in Zadunka Wola to avenge the hanging of Haman's sons. Similar incidents occurred in uh, the Piotrkow ghetto and the Sestelka, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, and in these other places. One of Hitler's leading Nazis was a man named Julius Stryker. The following day, after the Kristallnacht attack on November 10, 1938, Stryker gave a speech and proclaimed, just as the Jews butchered 75,000 Persians in one night, <laughs> that's the way they claimed it, but really this was uh, an attack against people that were going to destroy them, uh, the, these enemies. The same fate would have befallen the German people had the Jews succeeded in inciting a war against Germany. The Jews would have instituted a new Purim festival in Germany. Although Stryker's execution did not occur on the Purim holiday itself, he, he was actually executed on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the day of what's called Hoshana Rabbah, the great Hosanna, when they did the, you know, the major water pouring there. But, uh, but anyway, that, that's the day he was executed, uh, again, on, on a... At, at, a, at a holy time. But 10 Nazi leaders had been condemned and executed for their crimes against the Jewish people and humanity. He recognized that. Their mode of execution was hanging, uh, like, much like the 10 sons of Haman were executed in the Purim story. Nearly eight years later, Stryker never forgot the words he uttered about Purim. For him and his associates, Purim came early that year. Stryker and his fellow Nazis took place on October 16, 1946, which was, again, the 21st of Tishri, the seventh day of, of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, Hoshana Rabbah. Uh, the Jews believe this day represents the coming time when God's verdicts of judgment upon mortals is sealed, and we're going to go into all that. But this is why his last dying words, or almost last dying words, were he yelled out, Purim Fest 1946, is what he yelled before they hanged him to death. The words seemed like the mad ranting of a condemned man, but Stryker could not deny the poetic justice he was witnessing. However, in Stryker's twisted imagination, he assumed that the Jews would celebrate his death and the death of the Nazi colleagues as a, as a new Purim holiday. That didn't happen. Uh, the old Purim celebration will suffice. And uh, there's more to this. And by the way, as I mentioned, there's some argument that the, the little... The little letters in the script point to this this actual date in his, it, it, this this year in history when this happened, uh, and I don't know about that, and I'm not going to say whether that happened or not. But I do know again that God 
was involved in directing and guiding the outcome of both circumstances. And there was no coincidence here. You know, Hitler identified himself as sort of a new Haman to wipe out the Jews. Well, didn't work out that way. He was destroyed, and, uh, and we can be thankful that he was. Um, I want to mention a few things here in, in closing. You know, we know in our lives, we look at all the things that we deal with and what we go through and the trials and the troubles, and we don't see directly uh, the presence of God. But we know God is involved. We know the story that goes way back. You know, we trust it. Um, remember in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, that's where um, Thomas had not believed about Jesus being raised from the dead. But then he saw Jesus. And Jesus said, blessed are, are you because you've seen. You know, but what well, he said, you, you've seen and you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. And that's us. We've not seen, but we believe because we believe the testimony that has been passed down. Um, and we've seen much evidence in our own lives. There's too much that can't be mere coincidence. You know, the, the strength that we have to carry on, we just, we're able to do that because we know the truth. You know, so many times we don't see uh, God, but we know that he is there. There is a, um, there's a Christian song, a contemporary Christian radio, and it says, it's called God, God is in this story. It says God is in this story. God is in the details. Even in the broken parts, he holds my heart. He never fails. You know, he's in the details. Turn over to Romans 8. And I want to read something else that you may remember. This was uh, in George W. Bush's inaugural address. At the end of it, he said, after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, we know the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? And of course, that angel, meaning the angel of the Lord, the ultimate angel uh, who uh, was Christ. Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate, but the themes of this day he would know, our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. And if things seem to fall apart, brethren, they seem to go away, we look at the bad around us and we see a lot of negative and, and awfulness. But as we're told, you know, as he, as was said in the speech here, never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today. This work continues, this story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God is in this story. He is running things. And we read here in Romans 8.28 this wonderful promise that we can rely on, which says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You know, this is especially true for us, brethren, those who are the ultimate spiritual Israel of God, God's special focus among the nations. You know, we have to endure a lot of things. Um, Christians have been persecuted throughout history, you know, in many ways like, like the Jews. Um, and I'll just reference uh, some, some scriptures here that you could look at in this, this vein. Matthew 5.11, you know, blessed are they when they persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. Matthew 24, 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Uh, you'll be hated of all nations. Mark 13, 9, you know, they will deliver you to the councils. You'll be beaten in the synagogues. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. John 15, 18 through 21, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. You know, this would... Uh, Continue, John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They'll pull you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father and me. 
Are we prepared for that? Of course, even apart from that, you know, we always suffer the constant harangue and attack from our real spiritual enemy, Satan and his demons. And a lot of help comes from our, in, in that, comes from our own carnal nature. You know, I was watching a movie this week with Donna, the, this movie yesterday, which I, I enjoy this movie. Um, it's about this guy has an accident and he wakes up and nobody remembers the Beatles, you know, the singing group, because it, they, it's like they didn't happen or something. And, uh, and so this guy starts performing their music and he gets really big, but I, I go through all that. But there's an encounter at the end with John Lennon there who didn't, didn't do, wasn't the Beatles. But it reminded me, I made me think, and I've, I've said this quote from Lennon before, uh, that um, I think he probably got it from somewhere else, but it's a wonderful quote. And that quote is, it'll all be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And that's so true. But sadly, you know, John Lennon himself did not have the faith in God to see how that is actually possible. But it's more than possible. It's an absolute certainty. If you're in a bad situation, God will work things out. If the world descends into utter cataclysm, which it will, God will put it right. He will fix everything. But aren't billions of people going to die? Yes. But it's not over for them. Because God is in this story. And his subtle hand will not be so subtle then. For God will bring them back to life. And the same goes for all of us. No one can stop him. No adversary, not even death. Look here at Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not deliver uh, with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And we think about you know, the parallels in the story of Esther with the, the, the intercession there that takes place in the, in the way that everything is given to the righteous. It is quite amazing. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as, as it is written, for your sakes, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'll just leave you with this verse that I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. This is in Isaiah 43, 19, speaking of the ultimate future deliverance of Israel. Things will look dire and bleak, the worst. But God says, look, I'm about to do something new. Even now, it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. I'm going to make a way through, he's saying. Just watch and see, brethren. Just watch and see.